Ali? Yeah. Your mother stay here. ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、
uh, without exception. And when we mention all sentient beings, uh, we are referring to either uh, the three uh, realms. Uh, being the form realm, the uh, the formless realm, and the desire realm, that which makes up uh, cyclic existence, and all the beings within, uh, we can refer to it as the six realms of existence, uh, the three uh, miserable realms and the three fortunate realms. Uh, they contain the, the full sum of all sentient beings. And when we are visualizing all around us, we have the sense that all are there without any omission. Uh, <laughs> And so that uh, when we are visualizing the figure of the Buddha in the space in front of us, we should not see, feel that we have no connection uh, with the Buddha because this is a being who initially was just like us, a, a rank a beginner and uh, who uh, was uh, dominated by mental affliction in the same way as we are. But uh, for our sake, uh, who you know, developed the mind of enlightenment and for our sake, uh, who practiced on the path and uh, for our sake uh, completed uh, those uh, paths, the five paths and the ten grounds to attain full and clean and, and, and full enlightenment for our sake alone. And so we have that uh, very, very intimate connection with the, the Buddha in space in front. What and that, uh, that's, uh, that, that person who, uh, that being who has for our sake generated the mind of enlightenment, uh, trained on the path through that motivation and accomplished full and complete enlightenment, that, that Buddha, that enlightened being, has uh, the following characteristics. They are completely free of all fear in relation to suffering uh, for themselves. They are skilled in means in removing the fear of suffering of others. Uh, they work uh, for others with great compassion and without any bias and they work to benefit all and to uh, regardless of any benefits to coming in return ただ、それ <laughs> And that uh, we visualizing the figure of the Buddha in the space in front, we see the Buddha is marked by three syllables, a syllable Om at the crown, A at the throat, and Hung at the heart center. From the Hung syllable at the heart center, light rays emanate going out into the pure realms and inviting back uh, the wisdom beings and the empowering deities uh, from those natural abodes. Uh, the wisdom beings dissolve into the central figure and the empowering deities confer the nectar of empowerment, some of which now overflows at the crown, uh, spontaneously producing the figure of Akshobhya. What 
Tujige, Lama to be to Umbu, Kusun to get your dead temperature and tire Tava, each get the Bahundu get the Balas of what it is, Kumbashi. And that's when we view all the sentient beings all around, we see that they are bereft of the happiness that they so want, and they are inundated by the suffering that they do, do not want, uh, coming one after the other after the other. And uh, we see how um, difficult the difficulties that they have with this constant suffering. And uh, they look like we are to the figure of the Guru Buddha in front with a, a triple faith of pure faith, faith of conviction, and a manifest faith. What did and then we visualize you know how wonderful it would be we're making these supplications how wonderful it would be if uh, all sentient beings had happiness and the causes of happiness may this be the case may i see to it that it is the case so guru deity please bless me to make this so and then further uh, reflecting how wonderful it would be if all sentient beings uh, were free from suffering and the causes of suffering may this be the case i will see to it oh guru deity please bless me to make this so and how wonderful if all sentient beings had the happiness that knows no suffering and the excellent bliss of liberation may this be the case uh, i will see to it that it is oh guru deity please bless me to make this so and of course we we really recognize how beautiful these uh, immeasurable thoughts the very lofty noble thoughts are but without the foundation of equanimity uh, we will be constantly you know, they will be constantly compromised by our uh, discriminating attitude between liking disliking and so on and so we have to uh, also make a supplication to generate equanimity as a basis how wonderful it would be if all sentient beings could abide in equanimity free from attachment and anger and that holds some close and others distant may this be the case i will see to it that it is oh guru deity please bless me to make this so mm -hmm. Tene <laughs> As a result of the sincerity of our supplications, the five colored nectar lights begin to emanate from the heart center of the Guru Buddha in the space in front. This is uh, initially with the white light predominant entering into the crowns myself and all other sentient beings all around and affecting a thorough purification of all obstacles to our being able to generate uh, these four immeasurable thoughts and really laying a, a basis by which we can generate uh, these four immeasurable thoughts as a, a realization and again following further supplication on our part the uh, the colored the five colored descending nectar light begin again this time with the yellow golden light predominant entering into the crowns of myself and all other sentient beings and really then really empowering us to uh, really realize that we have that potential to generate uh, the four immeasurable thoughts to the level of realization 
Rwata Tambindua, And so when we take into account um, all sentient beings and uh, working for the purpose of all sentient beings, we really have to kind of understand how we go about that. What is the means by which we can approach such an incredibly uh, huge uh, objective? And uh, it kind of can be uh, you know, overwhelming. But when we look at it in terms of, for example, uh, seeing all sentient beings as one's mother, uh, really establishing uh, that all sentient beings have uh, innumerable, innumerable times taken on the role of uh, somebody, uh, somebody as precious as our mother. And then uh, by reflecting on how kind our mother has been in this life, we extend that. Uh, to uh, take to to establish how all sentient all sentient beings all kind mother sentient beings have been incredibly um, uh, kind uh, to us have sacrificed so much for us and and from that yeah. and then the uh, the desire to want to repay that kindness you know what is it that we can do uh, that can repay uh, such kindness now. Now, these three causes of seeing all sentient beings as one's mother, uh, remembering the kindness of the mother and wishing to repay that kindness uh, should have be a kind of an organic, logical process. And the sum of these three causes is, is the mind of affectionate love. When it, uh, we have fully developed that. And this is a mind that sees all sentient beings in the light of somebody who they are very fond of, that they are very much invested in their happiness, uh, that they are distraught if they uh, those uh, all beings are suffering in any way. And so that somebody has a much closer, much more affectionate sense of love for all uh, sentient beings on the basis of that. And it's kind of there is no effort uh, when it comes to benefiting sentient beings, uh, but uh, the, we are completely distraught if the, all any of those sentient beings, any of our kind mother sentient beings, 
are in any way suffering. And this is at a very powerful, but also absolutely crucial uh, stage to reach uh, when we're talking about the means by which we attain the state of enlightenment, uh, like the Buddha. And that uh, this sense of affectionate love is that which leads to uh, being able to develop the mind of compassion, uh, for really uh, doing something about this suffering uh, of others uh, as a natural, automatic kind of uh, mindset. And so it uh, it's kind of like if we do not have uh, that mind of affectionate love, and then we will not be able to uh, develop the mind of great compassion. And so this is uh, so Im important, you know, and that uh, and we we kind of like have to then, when we are developing these minds and we reach that point of the a fully qualified affectionate love leading to a fully qualified great compassion, uh, the question for of, of of in what situation can we actually uh, be in a be in a position uh, to truly repay this kindness to uh, truly remove uh, all the suffering of all sentient beings and of course uh, the state of enlightenment the buddha himself comes to mind the one who for the benefit of all of us has developed the mind of enlightenment and trained on the path and established full and complete enlightenment and so therefore uh, if we reach that kind of in inevitable conclusion that we too <clears throat> must attain that state of enlightenment in order to be fully beneficial uh, for all sentient beings. And that is the mind of enlightenment. <laughs> and of course, this is a Mother's Day today, so it's it's very appropriate that we should be talking about the kindness of a mother. Mm. So maybe it's uh, in modern times, you know, people actually do not, uh, are not fully aware of or don't pay attention to uh, the kindness of the mother and perhaps one of the reasons for, for uh, the establishing of uh, a Mother's Day. Yeah, <laughs> And so um, this brings to mind a, a time, uh, 2006, maybe again, I said? Yeah, six, uh, yeah, six. Seven, yeah, eight. going, uh, again, I was giving a teaching in the Blue Mountains in New South Wales and on the eight verses of mind transformation. And so in the midst of that, there was uh, giving an extensive uh, explanation on the kindness of the, the mother, mm -hmm. uh, during which uh, one of the, the women who was present at the teaching put her hand up and uh, exclaimed that uh, her mother was not kind at all. So again, I replied uh, directly to her and saying that, uh, you know, if your mother had not been incredibly kind, you would not be able to, you know, put your hand up here today and say that your mother was not kind. Uh, there would be no possibility. If your mother was not kind, you would not have the opportunity uh, to uh, raise your hand and say that she was not kind right now. Uh, 
And so again, I went to explain a little bit and saying that, you know, when you were still in your mother's womb, uh, you are incapable of saying anything like your mother was unkind. And for nine months and 10 days, she uh, looked after you there. And then after you were born, uh, again, she was kind of like absolutely uh, taking care of you at every moment because uh, you couldn't fend for yourself, let alone uh, tell her that she wasn't unkind, that she was unkind. And so that, uh, you know, it's because you don't uh, have a memory of these times that you <coughs> maybe fixate on perhaps one time, yes, where your mother was unkind and that uh, you allow that one time to cloud every other moment where your my mother was incredibly kind. Mm. And it may well be just this misunderstanding between you. <laughs> so again, I said, yes, if you, uh, if you claim that your mother was unkind, uh, then perhaps she would have taken the uh, uh, the choice of uh, of having an abortion and not giving uh, birth to you, uh, which sometimes happens. But in your case, this is obviously not what happens, and so therefore your mother was very kind. What <laughs> And in fact, when you think about it, the, the mother actually really, really sustains the life of a child countless times when they are that small, that they, when they can't do anything for themselves, not even to swat away a fly and uh, not to kind of protecting them from dogs and, and cats and other wild animals and cleaning them uh constantly as well all of this is uh, is the demonstration of a profound love that a mother has for a child and indeed you could say that they are saving their life um countless times and then when you, when you go into it a little further you can see that it's not just like a raising an animal in any way, but for a human being, they require uh, an education, uh, this uh, certain foods and so on, and all the expense that goes to raising a child, etc. All of this is counted. And, and so, you know, it's, of course, we take into account the fact that, uh, you know, the parents of a, of a child may not be, uh, you know, always correct in what they do, thinking, but their motivation is only ever to do the very best for their child. Uh, this is what they're geared to do. And when you really reflect on it there, you can see just how incredibly kind uh, the parents, the mother is. And so where the parent isn't uh, fully compass, of course, that that is very possible. Uh, they are an object of compassion, of course. Uh, but where uh, the uh, the thinking of the uh, parents is very uh, uh, right and proper, you can see that they are all constantly only ever thinking of what's best for their child. And you can see this love in the animal world, especially amongst the birds, where 
you'll see the, the birds returning with food and uh, without uh, having any themselves, they will uh, give that food to the chick in the, in the nest. And if there's danger uh, to their child, to their fledgling, uh, they will naturally even give up their life uh, in order to try and protect their young ones. And this is a profound love for their uh, offspring. And so that, uh, you know, one can get over a self-cherishing uh, attitude and be able to view all sentient beings uh, with that intensity, that intense love. This is the, the, the standard of the, what's known as the generation of the mind of enlightenment. And so, of course, uh, we, there are these instances where people are dominated by their, their self-cherishing and they make uh, unwise choices in this regard. Uh, but uh, by and large, you know, you can see how uh, parents are incredibly, incredibly kind. What <laughs> Shetu and so this um um when we recall the kindness of our own mother in this life uh, then we can uh, extrapolate out to the kindness of our mother in the previous life and the one previous to that in the one previous to that and we can see that this is very logical because if you know we have experienced the uh, happiness in the past and we are experiencing sorry kindness in the past and now kindness in uh, in the present there is no a uh, quintessential difference between uh, those kindnesses. They're still equally valid. And so in that sense, the kindness of mothers in previous lives is to be appreciated uh, in, in the same way as the kindness that we have experienced directly from our mother in this life. And so here, the kind of like uh, uh, that, that, that appreciation that arises through this sort of recollection uh, you know, leads to wa our wanting to be uh, everything to all these sentient beings, to offer them our protection, to offer them our benefit and help in every way. And this, of course, is the uh, developing of that mind of affectionate love. Uh, this uh, one who is really invested <laughs> in the happiness of others, regardless uh, of who they are. And so uh, that leads to then, you know, through this uh, establishing of Indeed, the reasoning behind past and future lives as well, the usefulness of being able to know that there are countless mothers who have been, you know, incredibly kind to me on a consistent basis through all my previous lives. And this leads to this whole sense of increasing the level of preciousness with which we regard uh, sentient beings. Well, uh, Cassa, 
And so I just uh, uh, there was a time when I was giving a talk in Dalesford uh, as well in a uh, a Christian church, and that uh, there, uh, following the talk, uh, there were some questions that came from uh, those attending. Well, well, plus, plus they are requested uh, what's called. Uh, and so the, the, their request was actually to, the topic was to speak about uh, death. Right, Chiwa. So, and that, um, and uh, again, I went through the teaching on death and, and really pointed out that uh, one of the main reasons why uh, it's good to uh, reflect on death is that it uh, it prompts us not to waste any time that we have in life and reflecting on how death is definite, how the time of death is indefinite and how at the time of death only our beneficial thinking, our thoughts, our virtue will be of any benefit to us. And so it's kind of to prompt us more mostly to really say, oh, I better not uh, you know, procrastinate any longer. I need to do something about uh, my Dharma practice now so we don't waste uh, any time. And then uh, further to that, then this, uh, I think, Trivati, because of the Yishugi Lama. And so the, from the yeah. audience, then, uh, the same question was put to uh, the, the minister that was there. Uh, yeah. What is the teaching, Christian teaching, I think, on death? Yeah. Oh, yes. And so, like they were saying that there are many people, uh, teachings on past and future lives was the question. And that came, and then the, the minister was asked for what the Christian view on this was. Mm. So they further gave more details in their question. They said, the, the questioner said that um, there are children uh, who remember uh, their past lives. And that uh, what does the what does what does Christianity say about this? the the minister handballed the question on to Genla, and Genla said, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, because uh, I actually believe in past and future lives. I accept <laughs> past and future lives. <laughs> so he said that there is uh, no explanation of this in Christianity. The <laughs> Oh, 
And so again, I said, but I do, I do, I will give an answer. I will give uh, my opinion on this uh, by, um, first of all, uh, pointing out that uh, with absolute respect towards uh, Christianity and all other uh, spiritual traditions uh, who don't necessarily have uh, teachings on uh, past and future lives, but uh, we can all agree that the the teachings on uh, love and compassion are sort of central uh, to all uh, teaching uh, uh, spiritual traditions. Uh, they really like the the essence, really, isn't it, of all the different uh, traditions around the world. And if it were the case that my say acceptance of past and future lives were to uh, compromise the generation of uh, love and compassion, uh, then, of course, I would completely dismiss uh, past and future lives immediately uh, because uh, it is uh, interfering with the very essence of uh, love and compassion uh, that is held to be the, the most important, uh, these more, most important qualities by all spiritual traditions. And so it's the case that if uh, the uh, acceptance of past and future lives was something that has just really helped to cultivate loving kindness and compassion then uh, and it, which is the case uh, in for me and uh, therefore i think it would be good for other spiritual traditions to uh, to consider uh, past and future lives <laughs> so uh, following my giving my opinion, the, the minister simply replied, yes, oh, yes, yes, that's that's what he had to say. <laughs> Not sure, hard. Uh... <laughs> 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 They're joking. But anyway, then you may use that. Go on, I'm going to dig it. ตบัดเนี่ยจะคอมเพตวอลตาชูจเบงกอลกะซะจับัดเนี่ยจะเสงเดรังเกเซมเนบุจิละเตเนยงกุตวายงกุตวางาลาตวะปะทะเมอยง
Sire, Tonye, Quenye, Desa, Morta, Takanga, and it loved John. Same thing, a little of John Good One, and it's expert. Kanga. And so that whatever we eat, whatever we drink, whatever we wear, uh, the car we drive, the house we live in, the work we do, and, and the respect we receive, all uh, arises from uh, the kindness of others. It arises in dependence upon uh, others. Yes. And so, you know, so when you think about the kind of like uh, all of the resources required just to sustain this body, uh, the, the food, the drink, the clothing, the warmth, uh, all the kind of like energy uh, that must be expended uh, just to sustain uh, the body, something that is in itself, uh, you know, uh, going to be no ultimate use to us. It is uh, has to be uh, disbanded or discarded at the end of life. Uh, and yet, all of what we depend upon uh, to sustain it uh, arises from others, in dependence upon the kindness of others. <laughs> But everything that comes from our body is is waste. It's considered as waste, and we we get rid of it. Yeah. And so everything that comes from it is discarded. We if it smells, we have to wash it, and and so on, and to uh to uh, you know apply different uh, scents and so on. And uh, and yet uh, everything that is, is to to benefit it to sustain it comes from outside comes from others. Well, from others, you know the the tremendous uh, uh, effort uh, of others uh, to provide what we need, uh, even to the point of others giving up their lives so that we can uh, have uh, we can sustain this body. And when we recognize this, when we really uh, know this, then we realize just how kind sentient beings are. And so not only when sentient beings benefit us, but even when sentient beings harm us, if we have the thinking to be able to transform that, we can see even that harm as being greatly beneficial. And so, for example, in the practice of patience, when it comes to really cultivating patience, uh, that uh, we are trained uh, to be able to transform uh, others' harm into that which is really helpful and beneficial for our cultivation of patience. Mm. And therefore, the sentient beings are incredibly uh, invaluable and they are precious. Mm. Because uh, we don't need to mention when they are beneficial to us, but even when they are harmful, they are harmful, uh, then they are incredibly beneficial also. And so what do we do then? What's our responsibility, our response to this incredible kindness, this preciousness? It is to be able to be of benefit to all those sentient beings. And so what uh, do all sentient beings require? They require uh, they, that they want happiness and they don't want suffering. And so from our point of view, they need the means by which they can establish uh, happiness and to eradicate suffering. And 
<clears throat> and so then how do they uh, get rid of suffering? Well, first of all, one has to realize that we are in cyclic existence. And as long as we're in cyclic existence, uh, there is no eradication of uh, suffering. Uh, that uh, we experience one suffering and get over it only to meet with the next one and uh, you know get rid of that one and then it goes on and on and on. So until we can get rid of or get rid of or release ourselves from cyclic existence, we cannot be released from suffering. And so, therefore, we look into the way in which the, the Buddha has uh, categorized suffering into three different uh, levels the suffering of suffering, the suffering of change, and pervasive suffering. And the suffering of suffering is well known to us. It, it, it kind of consists of mental and, and physical pain in one form or another. But it's the second kind of suffering of change that is so misunderstood in this world where most people actually perceive the suffering of change as, as happiness. And they, you know, this is where they put uh, all of their effort and, and, and focus on trying to establish this kind of suffering. So, for example, if one has no money, and then one has the suffering of uh, of being uh, poverty stricken, and uh, then one strives to uh, accumulate uh, money. And then one, when one has accumulated money, one no longer has the suffering of not having any money, but uh, the suffering of having money has just begun. <laughs> so again, if we have no home, and uh, you know we 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 want a home. We have to you know get the deposit together, and then if we can um, you know uh, get a house, then the suffering related to not being homeless is gone. Uh, but the suffering related to having a home has just begun as well. Oh, <laughs> And so, <laughs> and so that when you when you don't have a child, you know you have the that suffering of being childless, and you kind of if only I had a child, and so uh, then you uh, you you get a child, you have a child, and so the suffering of uh, being childless is gone, but the the suffering of uh, of having a child has just begun. And I said you know about that quite well. <laughs> <laughs> Same, you know, you haven't got a partner in life and that's a suffering for you. And then uh, you wish you had a partner and then you get a partner so that uh, the part, the suffering of, of not having a partner has gone. But the suffering of having a partner has <laughs> just started as well. <laughs> so, this is cyclic existence. And this shows that uh, this is the sign of, uh, of it being in the nature of suffering. So it, the, the point here is not to be overwhelmed by uh, this mm -hmm. suffering. But to simply go, I recognize then, ah, this is cyclic existence. And this is the nature of cyclic existence. I must get beyond this. I must get out of this. And so again, pointing to this, uh, this is what's called the, the physical aggregates, our body. Once we're born into this reality with this contaminated aggregate, uh, then suffering is inevitable. Hmm. And so unless we can cut this continuum 
of uh, of this uh, this coming into this world in this form of uh, contaminated aggregate. Um, it's just going to be repeated again and again and again. We we kind of re die and then reborn again, then die, then reborn again, then die, reborn again into this same reality of inevitable suffering. Then they in by Yenza, Sanje, Chen, Alola, because of the Tombani, Tombani's emptiness. So, what are the gates of the Chavarwa? And this is where this, uh, this quintessential Buddhist teaching. Uh, uh, on emptiness is uh, is repeated again and again is brought up as, as considered to be that which is so important. Mm. <laughs> ケバテガレルテネヨングレスナテネケゲアネセセレンセバスムセタバラテネオナセタワテレサバラテネゴトレツカレスナクンジュンゴネレクジュデニョモクンジュンポネサゴトワレクジュデニョモクンジュンデタ
And so it, it really is worth uh, highlighting uh, that this uh, particular uh, process by which the root cause of cyclic existence is uh, explained as uh, this particular ignorance of, ignorance of grasping at the true existence of a self-entity and uh, the solution, the, the wisdom realizing emptiness uh, is a teaching exclusive to uh, the Buddha. That, uh, and so therefore, uh, you know, even though we kind of have great appreciation for all of the wonderful teachings within the different spiritual traditions around the world, uh, it is only proper, right and proper that we should appreciate the Buddha uh, for having uh, uh, outlined uh, this particular teaching in, in in the way he has done so exclusively in Buddhism. And so that, uh, you know, everybody, all sentient beings want happiness and they do not want suffering. And so this is why we, you know, we emphasize this importance of recognizing suffering uh, of all the different sufferings and getting down to what is the root of suffering or what is the root suffering. And identifying this as this wisdom or this, sorry, this ignorance of the grasping at the self entity and um, and also uh, the antidote to that being the wisdom of selflessness and how the the Buddha alone has is been the one who expounded this is is it quite important ibayimbayine and so this importance of uh, of being able to understand uh, to recognize and to understand suffering in the true extent uh, of suffering is is quite crucial and uh, indirectly related to the extent to which we can cultivate compassion. Uh, that way, when we see how each and every sentient being suffers, um, but their understanding of that suffering is often limited uh, to simply recognizing the suffering of suffering, of saying, ah, you know, I'm sick or somebody is sick and kind of like being able to generate a sense of feeling uh, based on just their the visual uh, sort of uh, apprehension of suffering. Uh, the suffering of change is still considered to be the pursuit of happiness. And, and then let alone that, but they kind of have no idea of pervasive suffering, the true extent of how uh, suffering pervades everything. And so uh, without that, then we can see that their compassion is limited to the degree to which they can uh, understand the true uh, breadth of suffering. And so the Buddha is pointing out suffering in such detail uh, in order to facilitate the generation of a fully qualified great compassion. Nobody 
Tene yi maza tunge ke jyutukin ta, tunge ke nate ke, tanda ngosu tunge nate ke nikala nji ketu ete, ngu yu ke nisu shina yu kutu kutuwa. So, for example, we take an example whereby uh, one person is harmed by another. Uh, now, when we witness that, uh, we automatically almost have this sense of compassion for the victim. Uh, but we more likely have an anger or an aversion towards the one who is doing the harming. And so this is shows the, the limitation of understanding, of not really seeing what's really going on there. Uh, but when we see with more uh, depth and subtlety, uh, we can see that the victim is undergoing uh, the completion of a, a negative karma, whereby uh, they are kind of finishing up that suffering. And uh, whereas the one who is harming is simply creating the cause uh, of suffering. And so both have to be an object of our compassion. And this is seeing the reality of the situation. And so, of course, the, the conclusion of this particular scenario is not that we simply go, okay, now I understand. I can see that both are the object of my compassion and then and then leave. And no, in a in a situation like that, one the compassion, compassion itself is a is an imp we are impelled to act where we can. And we're acting by a clear understanding whereby the harmer is firmly an object of compassion, whereas their behavior is something that we act to stop and to deflect or to in, in whatever skillful way we can uh, to to uh, to avoid, to prevent. So it's important to think to think of whatever we can do uh, to prevent that harmful action and to do whatever we can to put a stop to it. What is the best? What is the best way of, of acting in that particular case? And so it's um it's when we talk compassion, we're actually talking about compassion in conjunction with wisdom uh, they must go together uh, whereby wisdom is like the eyes of what one needs to do and compassion is like one the legs that carry it out so you can see how the difficulty if you're acting one without the other if you uh, if you have if you're acting with compassion no wisdom and then you're not seeing what is the best means of of of, of rectifying a situation and if you're acting only with wisdom, uh, then you're not acting. You're uh, um, you're missing uh, the actual uh, the compassion that compels you to do. So, I apologize. I haven't yet got to uh, the text. Niba. Uh, Sonam gi gek ma yimbala ni. Gilag in the Nobody can see what's a red or the order. Nobody can get that. So, Red 
And so again, in the context of, again, where we see all sentient beings as uh, being incredibly uh, kind, uh, in kind, because whatever kind of we can develop in terms of good qualities, we can only do so independence upon uh, those sentient beings. Uh, no need to mention when they benefit us and they support us, but even when they harm us. And this is why it's crucial uh, that they are really kind as well, because we're transforming that into something which is uh, really, really uh, beneficial. And so it always requires us to be able to see the bigger picture, to see the actuality uh, of the situation at all times. And we're looking at an outline where it says here that uh, the second, um, there is no obstacle to merit. And what they're saying here in, in the face of somebody harming us, uh, that cannot be seen as an obstacle to the generation of merit. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be dealt with in a, a general demonstration of that point. And then it's going to be demonstrated through uh, uh, an image or example. So verse number 104 uh, says, if without it something does not occur, and if with it it does come to be, then since this enemy would be the cause of patience, how can I say that he or she prevents it? <clears throat> Rua Nebayina, and so here where it talks about if without it something does not occur and if with it it does come to be so here is talking about um you know the the object of patience uh, comes into being uh, through harm arising. So 
when there is no harm, uh, there is no opportunity for degeneration of uh, patients. So it does not come, a be, come to be. But when the enemy uh, who harms uh, exists, uh, then uh, patients has the opportunity to exist. And so it's saying there is a categorical connection when it comes to the virtue arising, the virtue, virtue that is patience. It follows from um, uh, whether or not there is the presence of, of an enemy, of the one harming. So one uh, true harm, can, one can generate patience. But when there is nothing there, there is no opportunity for the generation of patience. Therefore, uh, it's completely untrue, untenable uh, to say that the enemy creates an obstacle to our virtue or our, our merit. In, in fact, uh, it is the opposite. They are a benefit uh, to it. Without <laughs> And so, you know, that um, earlier or something I didn't uh, complete, and again, I was talking about the, uh, you know, the importance of how we view sentient beings in general. And here, uh, you know, quoting the uh, eight verses of mind transformation again, whereby uh, the great Geshe Langbi Tangpa it talks about seeing all sentient beings as even greater than a wish fulfilling gem. And that uh, the, the meaning behind that is that it is in reliance upon sentient beings that we can attain liberation and the omniscient state of enlightenment. They, in fact, facilitate our attainment of liberation and the omniscient state of enlightenment in whatever way they approach us or whatever way we see them. It, it, it's important, therefore, in this context that. Uh, we see that, uh, you know, in the degeneration of patience, whereby uh, we can have the, the, in the different kinds of patients, uh, the patients of uh, armor like patients or the patients of uh, bearing um, austerities, uh, and the third type of patients uh, of uh, not returning harm for harm. And this is uh, very relevant in this particular point, whereby. It uh, it is only it can only come into play when there is harm, isn't it? In that particular case, is when we practice the patience of not returning harm for harm, the harm has to be present for us to be able to avoid returning harm. And so, in this particular case here, saying that uh, to uh, the harmer, the one, the the so-called enemy, or the, the unpleasant person who harms or frustrates us or whatever, is the one who actually facilitates the generation of patience for us. They become the actual cause of our patience. And therefore, uh, you know, far from considering them as an obstacle or having some sort of a negative attitude towards them, uh, we should be absolutely grateful uh, that they are really benefiting us because it through, directly through them being a cause, uh, we can cultivate patience. What what 
Soba comes to do what I did, you know, do not in a can of dinner, yell seven in there by shinny dead to the kitchen mother. Rang is simply, no more she want the major tiller, Soba Sigurma, Soba Sigurma. And this, uh, this not returning harm for harm, and uh, what is absolutely a prerequisite uh, to engage in this kind of patience is to not allow our minds to fall under the control of anger. It, uh, it's extremely important because once we stay in a calm and clear uh, frame of mind, then the thought to benefit naturally arises. It comes up. And that uh, here we can see what best to do in that particular situation. Patience is not about, you know, just uh, covering one's head and taking the blows. And even if, you know, you were to die and so on, it's not just bearing uh, um, all the harm there is, but it is an active state of mind. But it, it acts from a position of calm where there is no sense of uh, mind agitation or anger. Sobacomsa and Patience is, is about, you know, completion, about uh, attaining. And uh, if it if there's something that can be done to completely, you know, pacify a situation, one does that. It's a, it's an active state of mind. It, the key issue is that it, does, it cannot act under the influence of mental affliction. Uh, it, it understands clearly that if mental affliction is present, it will only harm uh, uh, oneself as well as others. And so here, the mind must be completely uh, filled with compassion. Uh, this is the the way, the category of mind, the, the, the way in which we turn our minds. That and that, uh, you know, it's not a question of of just sitting, staying still, and being beaten or um, or attacked in some way. But uh, one is able to act, but not in any way uh, influenced by mental affliction. Order and not of a tone, and it never came in day, and it rang a soba comegi, soba comegeta, a chicasola, serve, yamlet, teleten, and soba taking a division in but not to it, you good one, not to watch a good one. And so even the, the reasoning continues to uh, see the situation whereby one is uh, not acting out of any mental affliction. And therefore, the thought to benefit is that which is foremost, is subsumed by compassion. And uh, even then, one looks on the harmer, uh, not as somebody who must be opposed, but rather that because they are facilitating one's cultivation of patience, they are like a teacher. And so you can see how uh, the relationship between uh, the so-called harmer and the generation of affectionate love here 
uh, are is, is something very very close and very very uh, kind of co-dependent in a way uh, that uh, when we view all sentient beings with the in the light of affectionate love and then uh, one won't be so quick to label uh, the that mm. person as harmer and that uh, one can see also uh, that um the uh, uh the kind of like way in, in which if we um, are not able to see the the one who harms as being incredibly beneficial, uh, then it is, is a mark against our affectionate love also. ま、ちょげ、ちょげ、あの、この調べ and so it's important to set this kind of motivation in the morning. The first thing, uh, when we're generating the, the mind of enlightenment and within that to uh, make a kind of like a point of that if one were to harm me today, I will simply return that harm with benefit. Uh, instead of harming back, I will be of benefit to them. And uh, to really establish that very strongly in your morning motivation, uh, so that throughout the day, even if you were to get angry, uh, that anger would not be very strong and would not last very long. So, <clears throat> so it's kind of important, isn't it, to do this kind of a, a, a preparation, mind preparation beforehand. It can be very, very useful. Um, otherwise, if we're not paying any attention at all, uh, that we're kind of very open to the immediate arising of mental affliction when uh, any uh, in, in unforeseen uh, inconducive condition arises, you know. Okay. So, but if we have done a little kind of a pre meditation, pre preparation, uh, then we have some sense of defense against these uh, moments and uh, the mental affliction won't arise. You would have been a lot of some of the other chimbo to Jungo Yorina or telling us of some Magena, get a Shatan Nona, I don't that the Abu Yungo Maria some such a Tambune to go tatty the journal, call Kate Shatan the Kanjit and the Shabuta, Lingo Yabu Jungo. ก็ตังบลโกตังเกตเดซับซามาเจติเดตอดาติเชบุเรอันนี้ที่เงเกตเดชะตานอนะตังตาจิกมาเรซัมซาตังบลเนซูเตติจิวะอีนะอันปิเ
Jude Menga, two when a Samlatan, Taxi Namja, the Jude Menga to Yan and Yando Samlatan, Yan and Yando Samlatan, the Simja Tamja, you won't get Jamba Machina Tamba inside, you won't get Jamba Yabo de Kibayina, and of course, Nova Kiban and never let the Pemba to two is you want to go to So again, what's most important in, in fact in all of this as well is what I was uh, talking about earlier, to kind of spend as long as you possibly can reflecting on, meditating on uh, the uh, how how all sentient beings have been our mother, uh, remembering the kindness of the mother, and then uh, repaying the desire to repay the kindness of the mother. It, it is said that when we have generated these three causes uh, sufficiently well in our mind stream and then the fourth cause of affectionate love will arise automatically and that's so important because when we have uh, developed a mind of affectionate love uh, that really makes it easier to generate compassion and uh, loving uh, kindness and compassion um, later on and so it's kind of really really important to, to see these three of uh, seeing all sentient beings as one's mother remembering the kindness and wanting to repay that kindness as like a foundation uh, for the later minds and um, and so so it's kind of really to look upon this uh, to really see this particularly looking at the kindness of the mother from many many different angles and to kind of really develop uh, a whole litany of the ways in which the the mother has been unbelievably kind and so that uh, when we you know, understand how all sentient beings want happiness and they do not want uh, suffering and that we can really slot in that kindness and that understanding of kindness in a situation where somebody harms. And so we don't even have the thought to repay or take revenge and uh, that, but we think only of how we can be of benefit to that person. And so whether we are looking at this in the context of uh, developing the seven cause and effect instruction or the uh, exchanging of uh, and, uh, of self and others, uh, and then this means it's so important to reflect on the faults on the one hand of self-cherishing and to see how indeed through being so kind of mired in this kind of self-cherishing attitude that all fault and all problems arise from that. And that uh, and when we transform that and exchange that for the mind which cherishes others and uh, to see how uh, conversely all benefit uh, arises from the mind which is dominated by uh, cherishing others and uh, to see how all of these fit in together very very important so we can see uh, how um, when we are unable to apply uh, that category of patience where we do not uh, respond to harm uh, with harm in other words we do uh, when somebody harms us we want to get our own back and to take revenge uh, this uh, shows clearly uh, that we are acting out of a self-cherishing attitude and that uh, when we are automatically able to uh, avoid and responding to harm with harm, but rather we choose to be of benefit and we see the benefit in what's happening. And then we are really, you know, comfortably uh, residing within the mind which cherishes others. And so again, to understand just how blinkered we are uh, in the self-cherishing attitude that we see very little except what uh, completely refers to ourselves, whereby 
if we are, we are abiding within the mindset of cherishing others, we see everything. We see the whole picture. And so it's kind of like the, the cherishing of others is a mindset that looks down from above where we see you know, a much broader perspective on things, whereby the self-cherishing is just looking up from below, uh, where we can only see uh, a very, very narrow perspective. And so that, uh, you know, when we are learning this and kind of learn to kind of really act with uh, make it by making unmistaken choices, uh, we can see how this is to our own uh, uh, around our own benefit ultimately. Uh, the second of these points was to establish this uh, point of uh, there being no obstacle to uh, merit uh, through uh, example. And so verse number 105 refers to uh, a beggar is not an obstacle to generosity when I am giving something away. And I cannot say that those who give ordination are an obstacle to becoming ordained. Would <laughs> And so in, in the same way, then it's saying here that um, to in order to be able to uh, be generous, uh, we cannot say that the, uh, the beggars are an obstacle to our being uh, generous. Um, and in the, in the same way also, that when it, if someone desires uh, ordination, uh, we cannot say that the, the preceptor or the, the master who gives the vows is one who is acting as an obstacle to our um, ordination. Um, and, and patience is the same in that regard. <laughs> And so in brief, it's saying that, you know, in order to practice generosity, uh, somebody who needs or a beggar is somebody is necessary. Uh, in order to take, um, you know, a novice ordination or um, or a full, a fully ordained uh, ordination, uh, one needs uh, a preceptor to to do that. Um, and uh, in the same sense, uh, if one is practicing the patience of not returning harm for harm, uh, you need uh, the harmer. You need the one who is harming. And so they cannot be considered as an obstacle. Uh, they are somebody who is facilitating uh, our practice of patience. They are a beneficial element. Uh, 
Take the party the Chimbalata, never kick in day, and it take a cause of the Chimani Sebeke, Aneta, Sobatubegia, Tunjanja Redwa, Taka, Kuja Redwa, thinking about Kogudwa. What are so the Chimba Pajan Joko Meva in Nako Nizolo, Chimba Pajan and Yamin Jeko Yoba in that top page Redwa. Take a Tunjan to Kogudwa, what are Tunjan to Chuma, Kabimana, that time the language, Jesu, what it is. And so this is simply looking at the, this as a a kind of uh, an accumulation of the necessary causes and conditions. So, you know, we, in the context of our wanting to attain enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings and uh, enacting all the activities of the the body body the body mind, uh, we are charged with uh, perfecting the six perfections. Uh, one of the six perfections is the perfection of patience. And uh, uh, within the, the three categories of patience, the one of uh, seeing uh, all dharmas, turning everything into a dharma practice, patience, the patience of accepting uh, of harm, the patience of not returning harm for harm in particular, uh, that we are we need uh, to create all the, the causes, don't we, in order to uh, perfect all these perfections. And that's when it comes to the creating the causes to cultivate the the harm uh, the the patience of of not returning harm for harm you need uh, the one who harms and uh, the one who harms is seen as a conducive condition as a cause uh, for our being able to cultivate uh, patience in this uh, this category of patience and so it's simply a, a logical uh, a, a kind of uh, understanding the reasoning behind uh, says that uh, the one who kind of presents themselves in this way as the harmer is uh, simply facilitating our practice of patience. <laughs> Because of the Museum was that Lou Gonata, the chair to the chair salad, and it took a song that can I tell the day by Yanako to Maduce Dua. That Samuel Tanda, the was Samuel Tandangi, because of the Samuel Tashin, the machine Kabacho, that Samuel Tashi by Yana, go Maduji, Madu and Nature Chagio Maria. Don't you did to be again? Way nature to my mother to be a chatter. Tanda Manjo Samotai, Tanda Manjo Samotai, Munajana, Matu Vajeta, Yena and Arazu Nomo and Shawan to two, and it did down the lending your own, did Matu Vajeta. Tanda, Sova comes again to Munajana, two Vajeta, Yena and Arato, and we will need to Majumaza, and did Matu was all strong to your. That you couldn't move on great to your. Once it did two by the chatter. Tanda Naranto Samotan, the Matu by the chatter, you know, we will touch some of the time machine on you, Matu Bati, Chesotan. To what you might So it's 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 down to a thinking, isn't it? The way in which we can um establish the proper thinking around all of these issues that you know we can have uh, danger to our physical uh, health in the terms of body uh, harm or even the even the point of death. But you know, we uh whether we kind of know what to do in those situations depends on whether we know how to think about how to uh, position our thoughts in all of these situations. And we must have this uh, understanding that uh, patience is always the, the possibility. It, we can uh, choose uh, patience in whatever situation uh, we might do. And if we can't, we have to know uh, that we have thereafter chosen uh, mental affliction, that we are under the influence of mental affliction. And so it's kind of like, it's a question of knowing, uh, you know, what, uh, what to implement in any particular situation. And when we have, you know, really familiarized ourselves with the thinking of patients, then we have a better chance of being able to implement patients in those situations. Right. 
to watch it. Get a tiny chimbo summer tanda, no do matuba for chatting to a moon nezula, get a tiny chimbo summer tanda, two at each other, because a jabe semayore. A dee, do me never chatter, do me your mare. Tangarazo, do me down the lente water. <laughs> and so, you know, when, uh, for example, in the terms of the mind of enlightenment and the actuality of that, when we uh, think on it, we kind of go, oh. Because the Tunga Tanik is so much good. Tunga Tanik is so bad. Naranzo in a so bad domain, what did Matuba sort of taunting it to a? Taka said, Tanisha, what did two was there? Tanaka and so um so it's uh, when it comes to the uh not returning harm for harm that patience you know, we might say that's so difficult, that's so beyond us, you know, it's something that, oh, I couldn't possibly do that. But from the, the point of view of the great body sattvas, it's a, it's, it's a natural kind of choice to make uh, that uh, there is kind of like, uh, they, they can't see any other way of being able to uh, uh, approach this. It's the kind of like the only choice available is to be able to uh, not return harm for harm, but return benefit for harm. The pento at the Sigiora. Then was the pento at the Maton and Yimbaza never gave out the pento at all that did Mumbaro, Chubarewa. And so they see the, the, the benefit of uh, the situation. And yet uh, when we, uh, you know, can't see that benefit, then we see only harm in that situation. And as if it like we run to harm, run to suffering. That was a so it's a difference between being able to see the actuality of the situation and not. So we uh, we leave it there for today. So again, we bring our minds to focus on the figure of uh, the Guru Manindra in front. And so we um, in then in initially founding or establishing a suitable seating arrangement on our crown, we reflect on renunciation, how all of cyclic existence is in the nature of suffering and we will not get beyond it until we gain liberation from the cyclic existence itself. And so we really generate this mind of definite emergence from cyclic existence. And that is symbolized by the, uh, the lotus mandala seat on our crown and viewing how all, all phenomena, internal and external phenomena, lack any objective existence and are merely imputed by thought. Uh, we focus our mind on that mere object, the, the negation of the object of negation, which is symbolized and by the sun mandala disc and this uh, lack of any uh, independent uh, or independent existence thereby uh, proving that all phenomena arise Musi placed here on my crown.
हेलो हेलो Uh -huh. Hello. 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 Ah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah. Looks in India. <laughs> <laughs> so apologies, everybody. Not sure what happened there. Yeah. But I'm not returning harm for yeah. harm. <laughs> <laughs> so right. as get I was saying, yes, uh, we have issued our uh, invocation, and so uh, our glorious and precious Guru, come take your lotus and mercy, place here on my crown, keep me safe in your kindness, bestow on me the attainments of body, speech, and mind. At the end of the first uh, recitation, the figure begins the journey from the space in front uh, towards our crown. At the end of the second recitation, uh, the figure has arrived at our pre-prepared seat on the crown. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the third recitation, we have the joy of really knowing that uh, the Buddha will remain there until we attain the state of enlightenment. Kumbashi and so then with the uh, the guru buddha on our crown we offer the mandala and the seven limbs of practice uh, this brings joy to the mind of the guru buddha uh, combining that uh, with that bliss combines with voidness, and they abide in the wisdom of non-dual bliss and voidness. Uh, then once again, then reflecting on renunciation, we begin the process of establishing a suitable seating arrangement at our on our heart. And again, true renunciation of seeing the suffering and cyclic existence and wanting a definite emergence from there. This is symbolized by the lotus mandala seat. And then through uh, recognizing how all internal and external phenomena lack any objective existence, even at the atomical level, um, we establish the moon sun mandala seed. And how this uh, lack of objective existence means that all phenomena arise in dependence and facilitates the mind of enlightenment, uh, we, uh, that is symbolized by the moon mandala seed. And then we again... Utter the invocation verse thrice, so glorious and precious root guru, come take your lotus and moon seed placed here at my heart. Keep me safe in your kindness, bestow on me the attainments of body, speech, and mind. At the end of the uh, first recitation, uh, that then is uh, the, the figure comes down through our crown chakra, down into the central channel. At the end of the second, they arrive at our pre-prepared seat. And at the end of the third recitation, we have the joy of knowing that they will remain with us until we attain the state of enlightenment. At this point, the petals of the lotus fold over and are sealed at their tips by a white five-pronged semi-vajra. Uh, that then is uh, surrounded by uh, three mantras. The name mantra of Shakyamuni Buddha in a clockwise direction, the mantra of Manjushri in an anti-clockwise direction, and the mantra of dependent arising in a clockwise mm. direction. 
and so uh, then from within the lotus leaves, the figure of Shakyamuni Buddha sends out light rays uh, through the entire breadth of our body, through every cell of our bodies, from the crown of the head to the soles of the feet. And uh, this uh, affects a very powerful purification of all negativities that we have accumulated since the uh, beginning of this time, including the 10 non-virtues of killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, of lying, harsh speech, divisive speech, and idle gossip, of malicious intent and covetousness, and, um, uh, and wrong view. And also of all the naturally occurring negativities and all those uh, mm -hmm. actions proscribed by uh, the Buddha, all negativities that we have accumulated in this life and the one previous to this and the one previous to that, going back to a beginningless time, mm -hmm. all downfalls, infractions of our bodhisattva vows, our pratimoksha vows, or our tantric vows, um, all disrespect from our parents up to our uh, gurus and uh, all of our negativities of body and, and mind that can act as major obstacles to our being able to practice uh, the dharma and uh, all of the imbalances that we have in our channels winds and drops and in the four elements uh, they are also uh, rectified and balanced what <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> And then uh, we also purify uh, that which is the greatest obstacle to our being able to quickly realize and attain enlightenment being uh, ordinary view and that uh, this is completely uh, purified. And then from here, uh, then through the combination of my own most uh, subtle uh, wind acting as the substantial cause combining with the the, the body of the Buddha acting as the cooperative conditions, my own body is transformed into the enlightened body of a Buddha. And then through the combination of my own most subtle mind acting as the substantial cause, together with the mind of the Buddha acting as the cooperative conditions, my own mind is transformed into the enlightened mind of a Buddha. And uh, now I see my body, speech and mind as completely uh, at one with the body, speech and mind of a Buddha. Uh, this brings a sense of joy which combines with voidness and I abide in the wisdom of non-dual bliss and voidness. Uh, the place I am in also is transformed from its ordinary state into the palatial abode of an enlightened being. And then seeing myself as a fully enlightened uh, uh, Buddha and also as uh, not existing in the way that I appear, uh, but being lacking any inherent existence, I send out light rays from my heart center, equal in number to all the sentient beings in existence in all of the six realms of existence. And upon and uh, dissolving into their crowns, they uh, spontaneously arise as fully enlightened beings. 
uh, the place that they are in is, is transformed of all contamination into a pure uh, palatial abode of an enlightened being. And again, I uh, rejoice uh, in this. Today is the day of being able to lead all sentient beings to that state of enlightenment. And this uh, leading of all sentient beings to the state of enlightenment, uh, the merit uh, which has uh, the, the virtue that has facilitated this, and myself as the agent of that virtue all lack any inherent existence, even at the atomical level and merely imputed uh, by thought. Uh, this brings forth uh, the sense of emptiness, which combines with voidness, and I abide in the wisdom of non-dual bliss and voidness. これ、ただただの場合、いや、無駄だって、例えば、ジョーマルは、いね、ただで、ジョーマルは、ジョーマルは、ジョーマルは、ジョーマルは、ジョーマルは、ジョーマルは、ジョーマルは、ジョーマル
You are Ravalakni Savara, great treasure of compassion, not aimed at true existence, and Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, as well as Vajrapani, destroyer of hordes of demons without exception, Tsongkhapa, crown jewel of the sages of the land of snows, Losang Drakpa, at your feet, I make request. Thank you. Thank you again, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much.